coming to the next talk. Um, again, we have someone uh, from outside the NEOS community. I'm very happy about that. Uh, the next talk is from Maciej Treda. He's a senior software development engineer at Akamai Technologies. Uh, he writes about JavaScript, Node.js and Angular and is founder of the NG Toolkit open source project. A set of tools for expanding existing Angular applications. He is an enthusiast of web technologies, especially single page apps, progressive web apps, microservices and the Internet of Things. He, today he's going to talk about asynchronous JavaScript mechanics, so enjoy Maciej's talk. Hi, my name is Maciej Treder. I'm from Krakow in Poland. Uh, on my daily basis, I am working for Akamai Technologies uh, with the product which is called Mobile Application Performance. But today I'm not going to speak about the content delivery network or mobile apps, but about JavaScript and the JavaScript asynchronicity. This is my handle. You can follow me on all of the social networks which logotypes you can see below. Uh, I would love to see new followers on Twitter so I could share with you my further activities, uh, which are which is quite a lot of because I am writing blog posts about JavaScript. Uh, I am presenting on the uh, on the conferences and so on and so on. This presentation is available for you offline on my speaker deck under the URL which you can see right now on the screen. So as I said, we are going to speak about JavaScript asynchronicity. So what is asynchronicity, why we even need it, what problems does it solve, and what are the pitfalls which you can run when uh, working with asynchronous code. We need to start from that, that JavaScript is a single threaded language. And this is very important, because what does it mean is that single thread is a single action taken by the program at the particular time. So here the question comes, how JavaScript deals with parallel actions? Let's say that you are reading a file from the disk uh, and in the meantime, you are performing another actions in your program. This is done in JavaScript by using the event loop mechanism, which we are going to cover deeply uh, just within the next minutes. Let's take a look at this simple snippet. What you can see here, are two functions. The first one is say something nice, which prints to the console log something. The second one is called greet. It accepts one param parameter, uh, which is the name of person who we want to meet, prints the meet to the console output, invokes the say something nice. And finally, uh, we have in the main thread, we have an invocation of the greet function together with the name John. Probably you are not surprised that the output for this code is as follows. So we are greeting John and then saying that it's nice to meet him. But what would happen if we will change the greet function slightly? So what we done here, it's applied the set timeout function, which takes as a parameter callback function, which should be executed after a given amount of time. In our case, we said that this callback function should be executed after zero milliseconds, so immediately. The output from this function would be for some of you surprising because we are printing the console logs in the reversed manner. So why, why does it happen? To understand that, you need to know one thing, that set timeout, set interval, uh, DOM events, uh, window objects, and much, much more of Java, of what you think is ja part of JavaScript is in fact not part of JavaScript. All of those libraries are external APIs which are, which are called by JavaScript. And those external APIs provide to JavaScript the, the callback or the results of the action which they performed, this callback is kept in the callback queue. And when JavaScript doesn't have anything to execute from its synchronous code, it picks up the things from the callback queue to execute them. 
So this is how it looks like, our, the snippet from the previous slides. So as you can see here, we have a stack where all synchronous actions are going to be put by JavaScript runtime. Then we have a callback queue that's a place for external API outputs. And finally, we have an event loop, which is depicted as a cogwheels here on the slide. So what is going on when this, uh, when this program is executed is that first we are putting the main function of our program to the stack. Then it, the, the JavaScript looks for the first function call, which is greet. Inside the greet, we have yet another function call, which is set timeout. Inside the set time, the, the set timeout is a top level function call. So it's not calling any function uh, inside. So this is where set timeout API is called by JavaScript because JavaScript see the top level function is going to execute it and pick it out of the stack. So JavaScript calls the set timeout and pass to it information about the callback function, our console log, together with the information when it should be invoked. In our case, after zero milliseconds. So the set timeout API immediately puts that callback on the callback queue. JavaScript right now, it's taking off sets, uh, say something nice from the stack and looks for the next, uh, and looks for the next uh, function which uh, which is invoked uh, within our code, which is say something nice. So we put it immediately to the callback queue to be executed when the stack is empty. So this is everything what is done with the set timeout. And this is why it's taken off the stack by the JavaScript. Right now, what it is doing is looking for the next function invocation, which in our case is say something nice. Within the say something nice, we have yet another console log so this is again our top level. There is no nested functions inside that. So JavaScript executes it, print nice to meet you, and takes it takes it out of the stack. This is all done within the say something nice. So it's took out of the stack as well, same as grid. And finally, we have nothing to do more within our synchronous code execution. So also our main function is took over the stack. Right now, when the stack is empty, JavaScript runtime looks into the callback queue, pick up the console log which it found inside and put it into the stack. That's the moment when the second console log is executed. So hello, John is printed to the console. That's the reason why we saw those output in the reversed manner. But let's take a look at the case study and let's take a look how event loop mechanism work in real life example. What I've prepared for you is an REST API service which is available under the URL which you can see right now. This service have three endpoints, directors, directors, movies, and movies reviews. All of those endpoints returns some data uh, related to each other. So directors re re returns information about available movie directors within the service. Once you will pick up a director, you can use his ID to check out the movies which were directed by this person. Once you have the movie ID, you can use this ID to review the reviews of that movie. Uh, those review are, uh, those review are containing the movie ID, reviewer name, and most importantly, the rating, which we are going to use, uh, with our case study. Because the question which we are trying to answer based on this RESTful API is what is the best movie by Quentin Tarantino? So what we need to do is query the director's endpoint, search for Quentin, then takes his ID, look for movies done by Quentin, later on take a, a each movie review, 
calculate an average score and based on that average determine which movie is best. The library which we are going to use to perform our task is request library available in the NPN. This, uh, every request invoked by this library must be done by passing couple parameters uh, to the function which this library stands for. So the first parameter is the API URL, the URL of the endpoint which you want to query. Later on, we are passing information that this endpoint returns the JSON output. And finally, we are passing the callback function, which will be put onto the callback queue by the request library once the API responds with the data. In our callback, we are just printing currently the, the body of the response. So executing this code uh, will give us the list of movie directors. Once we have that, we can use this list to search for Quentin Tarantino ID. So we are doing that by invoking the find method with, uh, from the array uh, prototype on the directors, uh, directors array returned by the directors endpoint. Once we have the Tarantino ID, we can use it inside our callback to perform another request and get the Tarantino movies. We are also placing the check movies count because we want to keep information how many movies have, uh, how many movie ratings have we already summed up. For each movie from the live, from, uh, from the response, we are performing yet another one to get reviews for those movies. And once we have those reviews, we are in increasing the check movies count, calculating the aggregated score from each rating and calc and then uh, divide it by, by the number of reviews inside the reviews array. Once every movie is checked, so the check movie count is equal to length of movies array, we can sort this array and determine that the best movie by Quentin Tarantino is the first item in the sorted array. However, this solution, have one big pitfall. It, are, it is performing just three REST calls and have eight nested levels. By nested levels, what I had on my mind, it's every time you need, you use the identification in your code. How to get rid of those? We can use the paradigm of creating the callback function outside of the request call. So we will use the request again, but instead of passing an anonymous function to it, we will go do that with the previously declared find director function, which you can see right now. It performs exactly same logic as the previous example. Inside this function, we are calling yet another request and we are passing to it the get reviews function. So let's declare it once again. Inside this function, which again, uh, which logic is again uh, similar as in previous example, we are calling a request one more time and pass to it a calculate average score callback, which we declare above. Once we get all of those in place, we can print out what is the best movie by Quentin Tarantino. The problem here, we get out of the we get out of the eight nested levels. We get just two right now. But the problem here is our logic is reversed. So we are first declaring some functions which are later on used in the code. So when you are reading it from the top to the bottom, you don't have a, even missed the idea what will be going on with this code. If you would like to follow offline those two examples, here are two uh, blog posts which are available for you and links to them are available on my speaker deck when you can reach the presentation slides offline. Let's move to the next section of the presentation and think how we can solve the problem of reverse logic. This is where promises comes with a rescue. What promises is an object which represents a uh, an action which will be executed somewhere in the future. And maybe it will return some value, maybe it would reject, maybe it would fail. 
To create such uh, basic example of promise, you can use the new promise. Uh, you can use the promise constructor with the new keyword by providing to the constructor uh, the callback function, which accept up to two parameters. In this example, I use just one for simplicity. This parameter is a is a resolve. That's a, that's a reference to the function which should be invoked once you want to uh, re return the value from the promise. So after one second, our promise will send the information with the value from promise one string to the callers. To get that action, you need to use the then method on the promise object. Uh, the big advantage of the promise is that you can reuse it in the couple places in your, in your code. So the output of this snippet uh, would be printing value from promise one twice. What you need to keep in your mind is that promise can resolve only once. You cannot send multiple values one after another from the promise. This code won't fail to compile. The, compi the, the JavaScript runtime won't have any, uh, any warnings about it. It will just silently fail. So you will resolve your promise with the just first value. To inform the promise caller that the asynchronous action which he is waiting for failed, you need to use, uh, you, you might use the two parameter constructor, uh, within the function passed to the promise constructor. That second parameter usually calls reject is a reference to a function which is called when you want to inform that you are rejecting this promise because of some some reasons. It's nice to say that reason with, within the reject. If you want to catch an information about that, you have two ways to do that. You can pass to the then the two callback functions. The first one stands for the uh, for the happy path of the promise resolve and the second one for the sad path or bad path when promise rejects. The second approach is to use the catch method on the promise. And I personally prefer the second one. And this is what you will mostly see, uh, on the internet and on, in any reference you would, uh, you would read. This snippet would print to you that rejection has been handled by uh, by the callers and the reason of rejecting is nicely printed out to the console. Another way of throwing rejection, of saying to the caller that promise failed, is to throw something outside from the promise. This code will work exactly as the previous snippet, but you need to keep one thing on your mind. It doesn't matter if you will use reject or throw. You cannot catch promise rejection within the try catch block, try catch finally uh, block. This code would fail and will print to you an unhandled promise rejection warning in the console. The huge advantage of promise over callback is that promise can be chained with the other promise. Let's take a look at this snippet. What we have here are two promises. The first one resolves immediately with the value three. The second one resolves with this value squared. So multiply it by itself. So our task right now is to get the multiplication of the first promise resolution. We could do that by calling the square function, which returns promise inside the callback pass to the den. But because then returns a promise, you can call the then again on it. So once the promise one resolves, we are calling the then, you invoking the square function inside and returning it out of this callback function. So the value returned by the promise from the square function is available within the next then in the chain. So you can catch it and print it out to the console. Obviously, the output for those snippets is nine. 
more about chaining. You can chain What is great about chaining is that you can catch all of the uh, all of the errors occurred within the promise chain at the very bottom uh, of your promise chain. So this catch statement would, would would catch any any rejection which appeared in one of dance be, uh, one of dance above it. In such case. Because the second then, this promise in the second then throws an exception, throws, uh, rejects, we won't get into the third promise, which prints some value to the output, but we will go straight forward to the catch statement, which prints the catched string. The finally statement is executed as you expect. So it is called after the whole promise chain is done. Remember about chaining that you can use multiple catches within your chains. In this example, the rejection has been catched uh, by the first promise, the rejection thrown by the second then. It prints out the information that it has been executed and the uh, error has been catched and returns some default value, in this case, one. This default value is a promise resolving with the value one. So you can apply yet another then on the chain, which prints out that value to the console. The last catch is not invoked because the issue has been already catched, the issue from the second promise. So there is nothing to, more to catch. The final statement is executed as you probably expect at the very end of the chain when all of the action has been done. Another great thing about promises is that you can combine multiple of them into one promise. So let's say we want to have an information about all, we have a three promises and we have, want to have an information about all of those promise results together. To do that, we are using the promise all method, which I accept as a parameter RI with the promise which we want to combine together and returns a promise which represents the results of all of those prompts. But what you need to remember is that if even one of the promise passed as a power passed within the parameter RI uh, to promise all rejects, then the whole promise returned by the promise all rejects as well. So you won't get even one result. You can bypass this mechanism by catching possible errors which might be thrown by your promises and return some default value from your promise. In this particular case, is undefined. So such promise all will return information about the resolution from promise one, square two, and undefined for promise two, which rejects. There is a similar mechanism which you could use, which is called all setlet. The difference between all setlet and all is that all setlet will never reject. Once the promise in within the, which is within the all setlet rejects, you will see that in the information about the promise status. The pitfall about the promise all setlet method is that not, is that it is not available uh, in every JavaScript runtime. As you can see for Node.js for, for which this snippet is written for, you need to install an additional uh, JavaScript shim and apply it uh, to have the promise all setlet uh, function on your promise object. Another way of combining promises is to using the promise race method. This promise again accepts the array of the promise, but returns the promise which represents the fastest one from the array. So it returns just one result. Again, same as the, in the promise all. If even one of, uh, of the inner promise rejects, then the promise race rejects as well. So be aware of that.
you can of course bypass, bypass it. Let's now think about following scenario. What I want to do is to get the first correct results rather than reject rejection. If nothing resolves within the, the two seconds, I don't want to wait anymore and I want to be informed about the timeout elapsed by the rejection from, from my promise race. So what happens here is changing, chaining the rejecting promises to promise with, to promise which never resolves. This is what we are doing with promise two. And we are adding the watchdog promise, which rejects after a specified amount of time. So thanks to that, of course, this, this snippet results with three, but if we would result with three or the square after more than two seconds, we would be informed with the catch statement that none of the promises results before the watchdog. Okay, we spoke a lot about promises. Let's get back to our use case and the question, which movie is best by Quentin Tarantino? So for to answer that question for our purpose, we are we will use the fetch library from the node, we will use the fetch method from the node fetch library. It's working exactly the same as a fetch function within your browsers. So it accepts the, uh, the string which represents the REST API endpoint and returns the promise with the response uh, from that uh, from the request. The first action which we are picking is to return the response JSON representation. So we have our directors list on our on our promises chain. Once we have the directors list, we can find out the the Quentin Tarantino ID and return the promise representing call for the Tarantino movies. Once we have those movies, we are setting up the reviews array. We are going to feed it array within the for each loop, which we invoked on the movies array. Inside this array, we are pushing the promises which represents calls for the reviews of the movies. Once we have the, once we have review array fitted with data, we are returning for our promise chain, the promise all and pass the array of promises to it. Thanks to that, on the next chain, we have an array of objects represents, representing movies together with their reviews. So once we have those, we can calculate an average score. And once we calculate that score, we can return movies and ratings array sorted by an average score. Once that array is in our hand, we can print out the best movie title. This is this is how uh, this flow has been executed on the yet another diagram. So it started with the Node.js calling the fetch directors API. One, this returns the promise inside which we are saying once you will have that action, once you will have those directors, find out the Tarantino ID and call the API again using the different endpoint. Once you will have a re response from that call, call all movie reviews. And this is what we put into promise all array, the promises representing those three calls. Once we have those response, we can calculate an average and pass it to another part of our promise chain. Once we calculated an average score, we are printing out that information to the console output. You can follow those, uh, you can follow offline what is covered by this part of presentation by visiting one of those uh, blog posts. Let's move forward to the next part of JavaScript asynchronicity. So we know already promises. They are great for working with the REST APIs, reading files from the disks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But they have one pitfall. There are not repeatable. 
What do I have under my mind by repeatable? Let's think about the WebSocket protocol, which is getting popular more and more today. Or about push notifications. Those are the repeatable protocols which are continuously pushing the data to the client rather than waiting for a client pulling the data from it. So this is where RxJS comes to the action. The main interface of the RxJS library, which is available under similar name in other, uh, in other programming languages. So there is Rx Java, Rx Swift, and so on. Just Rx stands for ActiveX, JS for JavaScript. The, the main interface, uh, which stands for ActiveX, is observable. Observable is representing the stream of data. So when you want to create observable, you can do that with calling the create method on the observable interface. This is one of ways of calling the observable, but this is the most basic one. This constructor, constructor accepts a function, a callback function, which takes, uh, which takes one parameter, which is an observer. Observer is an object which you are going to use to push the data through the observable. To do that, you are using the method next available on the observer object. So this observable will push out the string tick after each second. This is done within the set interval. If you want to retrieve the data from the observable, you are subscribing it. So you are calling the subscribe method on the observable object and pass to it a callback function which you want to execute with every single piece of data pushed by an observable. This snippet will output following, uh, following to the command line. The problem here is that this program never stops. If you want to stop the observable or if you want to stop getting data from the observable, you need to call, you need to unsubscribe from it. How to do that? So calling the subscribe method returns you the subscription object and subscription object is exactly that where the unsubscribe method is available for you. So here, after three seconds, we are unsubscribing from observable. So because of that, we are printing just two ticks to the output. But you can subscribe to the observable yet another time. So we are subscribing again after four seconds and print out and continue to print out the values returned by the observable. What if you want your stream to stop broadcast the data? You can do that by calling the complete action on the observable. This informs all of the subscription that this observable will not emit any data in the future. Finally, to get out of this program, we need to clear interval set up within creating the observable. As you can see within this snippet, we created the observable using subject. This is yet another technique of creating observables, and there are tons of subject implementations which you can use on your own. Okay, so you know how to retrieve the stream of data from the observable. How you can manipulate the data? What you can do with it? Do you recall the promise chaining mechanism when we are changing the data between each pieces of the promise. We can do the similar, quite similar action with the promises. So what we are going to do now is to call the pipe method on observ observable and pass to it an operator, uh, which is imported from the RxJS operators library. Thanks to that, this particular op operator is changing the output of the observable. So for, so we are checking if we have even or odd emission 
And based on that, we uh, returns tick or talk value because this is the sound which clocks used to uh, used to do. There are, of course, map is not the single operator which you can use. There are tons of them. The, the list of operators together with the decision map is available under the link which you can see right now on the screen. Uh, so for instance, there are operators like dropping some value from the operator stream or creating another observable based on the input from the outer observable, and so on, and so on, and so on. Let's take a look at one of the operators which is useful for catching error in the observables. So let's say our clock, which prints for us right now tick tock, tick tock, at some moment in the, in the future, it's exploding. So it's a time bomb rather than a regular bomb. So because of that, the set timeout, which you can see at the very end of the, of the snippet, will never be executed. Because throwing an error from observable caused the runtime, caused the program to break and exit. How to catch that error? Because we had the catch mechanism, the promises that there must be something for observables as well. And there is. It's called the catch error operator. So you can add it into your pipe method just as a next operator. This operator accepts the callback function, which takes one parameter, which stays from the thrown error, and returns an observable, which should be emitted instead the failed one. So in our case, we are using the static off method from the RxJS library to uh, to broadcast just one information that the explosion has occurred. So instead the error boom message on the output, we would see the explosion, our program won't fail, and the still alive question will be still printed after 12 seconds. So those are the changes which we apply to our code to catch an error. And this is how it looks on the time axis, the flow of our program. So within the first second, we are printing the tick uh, on the output. With the second one, the map changes that tick to the talk and print it to the console. Same with the third, four, and finally the five, when we have the boom error uh, occurred within the observable. But it's catched within the pipe. So thanks to that, on the console, we are printing the explosion information returned from the catch error operator. Our set time, our set interval function still go on. So another tick appears on the six seconds. Finally, we have the information which is asking if we are still alive here. Okay, so let's use right now the RxJS together with our RESTful case study. So again, we are going to answer the question, which movie by Quentin Tarantino is best? For this purpose, we are going to use an access library available in the NPM. This library gives us to us, uh, for example, the get method, which stands for the get, uh, get method performed within the rest and returns an observable representing the response uh, the response from the request which we performed. So what we can do here with this observable is pipe it with some operators. First of all, the map operator, because we want to transform the response object to just the response data returned by, the, uh, by our endpoint. Once we have the data, we are going to find the director ID and return it to the next operator, which is a flat map. Flat map is operator which returns a new observable, which will be placed instead of the outer one. So we are replacing the get JavaScript directors with the get JavaScript directors slash ID slash movies. And map that response 
to print just the response data. Once we have the response data, we are again using flat map. Right now, we are going to iterate through each movie which we get in our chain and put the observable representing uh, the request for movie reviews into the observables array. Once that array is fitted up, we are returning the, we are returning it using the combined latest operator. Uh, this operator works exactly same as promise all for promises. So it combines the observables passed as an array parameter and returns just one observable, which represents all inner observables passed to it. Once we have those observables uh, and the data, we can sort our music movies based on the average score and print out the movie title. Finally, we are subscribing to the to the observable and printing out to the console what is the output. So what are the advantages advantages of using RxJS rather than promises? First of all, you are given an library full of operators, which are very useful. One of them is, for example, retry. Think about the situation when your customer loses the internet connection once he is trying to perform the request. Thanks to this parameter, the, the get method will be, per, would be, will be performed three times whenever the will be retried whenever the error occurred up to three times. Another, uh, another pros for using RxJS is that you can synchronize it. You may synchronize the, for example, REST calls together with the web sockets or any other stream of data. You can follow the, uh, you can follow offline the examples which I provide to you right now with those posts available on the Twilio.com blog. But as the presentation title says, we are going from the asynchronous code to the synchronous and back again. So far, I was speaking continuously about asynchronicity, which is quite complicated because it's full of callbacks, then subscribe, nested levels, operators, and so on. So make the code synchronous again. So what we can do for the asynchronous code to utilize its, uh, its result within the synchronous code execution. Let's take a look at the simple code snippet. We have the get multiplier, which returns promise resolving with the value two, and multiply, which stands for the function, which resolves uh, with the a resolution of multiplication of two values. So with the straight promises, with, with the promise chain, you, will, uh, you would call the get multiplier, then within the callback call multiply, uh, return from the piece inside your promise chain, make another then, and inside that another then, print out the multiply results. But what would be great to do is to somehow get those values synchronously. So we could just set up the multiplier variables or the results variable to, for example, utilize it later on or for code your readability. And this is a, and you are able to do that with the await keyword. Await keyword can be used together with the promise and it's cause the JavaScript runtime to synchronously wait for the promise results and returns uh, the, the value with which promise resolved. The problem here is that this code won't compile. Uh, this code won't run. The JavaScript will complain against you that awaits uh, keyword can be used only within the async function. What we need to do to use the await keyword is to make the code asynchronous again. Because what is an async function? It's just an information for JavaScript 
that this function returns a promise. So the whole function body should be wrapped within the promise object. And what this promise resolves with, resolves with is the value returned by the async function. So those two code snippets, which you can see right now, are equal. They are equivalent. Okay, so how to make so how to make our code with calling the promises uh, synchronous again within the asynchronous function which returns the promise? Simple. Just create an anonymous async function which you are calling immediately once it's declared and initialized. Thanks to that, we can print out that multiplication of 20 and 10 equals 20. So this is our difference, the two examples. On the first point, on the first look, the second one looks uh, clear, but you will find out that when you have more calls and more code, the async await gives you a tremendous clearness of your code. How async await works with RxJS, which is a successor of promises or some kind of successor. So you can use it because observables are shipped with the promise, uh, with the method, which is called to promise. But, need, but you need to be aware of this method because the promise returned by to promise method will resolve once the prom once the observable is uh, once the observable completes and it will results with the value which is lastly emitted by an observable which in our case is 2 what about the errors what about the promise rejection rejections here with the async await you can simply use the try catch finally construction which is quite straightforward. If you want to throw exception from the async function, if you want your async function to return promise which rejects, you simply use the throw statement inside. Okay, let's take a look how the use case of the determining the best movie by Quentin Tarantino looks like when you are using the async await paradigm. So first of all, we are importing the NodeFetch library, which you already know from previous uh, examples. We are declaring our asynchronous anonymous function, which we are invoking immediately. So within it, we are able to use a wait keyword. Under the di so the next step is to declare the directors constant under which we are keeping the list of directors. We are synchronously wait for the promise resolves because until we doesn't have directors, we have no need to work with in the future. Once we have those directors, we can look for Quentin Tarantino ID and get Quentin movies again by using await together with the with the together with the promise returned by the fetch method. Once we have reviews, we are once we have movies. We are going to retrieve the reviews for those movies. So we are putting all of those reviews into the, uh, into an array and await from the promise all resolves and keep the return value under the reviews constants. Once we have reviews, we can calculate an aggregated score and calculate an average score and determine which movie by Quentin Tarantino is best. In my opinion, this is the most clear way of achieving this task. But you need to be aware of one thing. As I said, a wait is synchronously waiting for the promise resolve 
and it wait with no mercy. So there is a huge difference in those two code snippets which you can see on the right side. The first one executes within the four seconds, while the second one within just two. The reason is that within the first call, uh, in the first snippet, before we will call the second promise, we are synchronously blocking our JavaScript on waiting for the first one. The better approach is to invoke promises first, and once the action within the promises is taking an action, then just await for results. Finally, let's compare all four methods of working with asynchronous code, which we cover it today together. So first, repeatability, callbacks, or so, so first of all, how they are working. Most of them, three of them are, syn are asynchronous, while async await is hard to say if it's synchronous or asynchronous. It's synchronous in, in, his, in its nature, but executed within the asynchronous function. Repeatability. So callbacks are for repeatable action, like DOM events, etc. Promises are one shooters. Once promise resolves, you can never get back to it. RxJS are repeatable as well as callbacks. What about the reusability of those? Callbacks are quite not reusable or they are hard to reuse, while promises and RxJS can be called whenever you would like in your code, uh, so, so you can use it in multiple places. What about manipulating the data inside? So I would say that callbacks are not manipulatable, but with the, but with the restriction that by the manipulation, I understand changing the, changing the value on the output of the mechanism. So what finally comes to the callback function? And the use cases, as I already mentioned, callbacks are really good for DOM events uh, like mouse clicks, etc. Promises are perfect candidates for REST calls. RxJS is great for protocols like WebSockets or push notifications. And also it is good for uh, from DOM events and REST calls when you want to synchronize them with each other. Async await, on the other hand, is perfect from the operations which depends on each other's. So like in our use case, the set of REST calls, while you cannot perform the next one until you doesn't have the response from the previous one. If you would like, uh, here you can find the list of all resources uh, used within this, uh, within this presentation. I am again strongly asking you to follow me on Twitter because this is not everything about my publications on asynchronous JavaScript. I am still in the process of writing uh, the series about that. And finally, at the very end, I would give you an answer. What is the best movie by Quentin Tarantino, which basing on the review scores from our use case is Inglorious Bastards. And I would uh, kindly ask you to provide a feedback for this presentation uh, using the form which URL you can find on this slide. One more time, the, uh, the presentation is available for you offline under this URL. And again, my name is Maciej Treder. You can follow me under this handle on the Twitter, Stack Overflow, LinkedIn, GitHub, GitLab, Skype, NPM, Medium, Speaker Deck, and much, much more. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Maciej Trader, for this interesting talk about asynchronous JavaScript mechanics. Uh, 
I'm not a developer myself, but what I've heard uh, from uh, backstage is that this was a really nice overview and you know concept deep dive to understand how asynchronous JavaScript works. So uh, as we make big use of JavaScript in Neos, the whole Neos uh, backend UI is written with React. Uh, I assume that you know makes a lot of sense for people um, to, to, to be aware of these mechanics.